about causation and then going to give us a talk of correlations and causes. Okay. David C.G. has graduates of the United States. Last year I did a course on causation, so a lot of this came out of that. Shall I go? Shall I start? Okay, thanks, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I just want to try some stuff out on you. It's quite tentative. Uh, so it's got two parts. So first of all, I'm going to lay out a way of thinking about the connection between correlation and causation. I'm just going to appeal to a lot of stuff from the Bayesian net, DAG, directed acyclic graph, modeling tradition. I knew it long ago as a lot of it was in multiple regression thinking about, about causation. And I've always been interested in the idea that there's a, uh, the meat of the metaphysics of causation is in this stuff. And so I'm going to try and put that to you. You, you can tell me why, why it's the wrong way to think about causation. But then after I've done that, I'm going to try and show you that that it's wrong to think of this stuff the equalization is somehow connected to grounded in correlations as an agency theory of causation it's anything to do with human action it's now to philosophers often referred to as the interventionist approach to causation and I'll explain why that so many people think that somehow you're explaining uh, uh, causation in terms of action or the possibility of action or something like that and I'm going to try and show you that's completely misguided and uh, perhaps is a good place to do that because two of my targets will be recent students of Barry uh, Alison Fernandez and Thomas Perdue they both try and develop this kind of action based approach to causation and Barry I know is sympathetic so I'm going to try and show at least Barry that this is this is not going to work so that's, that's the plan. So, the first half, I'm going to look at the possibility of inferring causal structure, facts about causation from correlations. So, the idea is you start with a bunch of correlations. And you churn various bits of machinery and you get causal structure out of that. Now, I want to think of the correlations as real law-like population correlations. Uh, there's an issue about, in real life, we start with statistics and in, in finite, finite samples, and we have to infer the correlations. I'm assuming we've got past that stop step. So we've got, we've got uh, probabilistic facts like, I don't know, you shuffle a, a pack well and you pull out a card, it's a one-fourth chance it's a uh, heart. Think of you know, probabilities like that. So, uh, so I'll give you an, an illustration. I mean, a lot of you, this will be familiar to, to you, but let, let's just go through it. Suppose we start with facts like some A, what do you want to think about? Well, I'm going to think about later on an example, uh, type of schools, private schools, um, uh, public schools versus good exam results, bad exam results. Suppose you have a uh, parental income level. Suppose you have A correlated with B, A correlated with C, B correlated with C, but A and B are independent given C. C screens off the correlation between A and B. And given that, the, the natural thing to think is that uh, C is a common cause of A and B. But in fact, uh, if you think about it, you'll get just the same correlations if A is causing C is causing B, or indeed B is causing C is causing A. All of those will give you the same uh, all three variables will be, will, will, be, will be correlated and the correlation between A and B will disappear if you hold C, hold C fixed. Look at cases where you've got C, cases where you haven't got C separately. But what you can conclude already from those initial correlations is you haven't got A, B, C. Because the natural thought is if, if you had that, well then A and B wouldn't be correlated. I mean, in this causal structure there's no there's no reason to expect A and B to be correlated. So you can rule this out. 
given those correlations, but you, but you can't decide between those. But still, suppose, suppose you get some more probabilistic facts. Suppose you find some, some D that's, what have I got, independent of B, it's correlated with C, and it's correlated with A. And it's independent of A given C. So C screens off the correlation between D and A. If you got that, well then that fixes for sure that the causal structure is, is that. B and D are independent causes of C and C causes A. Uh, so crucial fact here is that D is independent of B. So they've got to be exogenous variables going into something else. So that's that's the general kind of uh, machinery that lies behind the, the Bayesian net approach to causation. Uh, here are the assumptions, well I'm not going to read through that because I'll get in the tangle. Huh? The assumptions driving these inferences are basically, look, think, think of two variables being causally connected just in case either A is causing B or B is causing A or they're the results of a common cause. Then they're causally connected. The basic thought is that two variables A and B will only be causally connected. They'll be causally connected if and only if they're correlated. That's, that's, that's the underlying thought. People tend to focus on the fact that that, that says that if they're correlated then they're going to be causally connected and in fact something else that's in, in what I've written up there, uh, uh, the correlations will be screened off by anything causally intermediate between the things that are causally connected. But in fact what's doing most of the work in these inferences, or uh, not all of it, but is the kind of most powerful thing, is the second thought, which is if they, if they aren't correlated, then they aren't causally connected. If you think about it, that's what I did here. I mean, these two aren't correlated, so uh, they can't be causing each other or have a common cause. And here again, that was, that was the thing that told us those arrows were going in. So... Just to be clear, A and B are types, then types. Yeah, 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 please, please. Uh, so, sure, no, we're, we're getting correlations. Uh. So, you might worry if you do something like this, We've got a complicated world, there's all kinds of variables you can look at. We've been looking at some subset of the variables. Is, is the procedure sensitive to which variables we include in our model? And yeah, it's pretty obvious that, that it is. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can have a, a kind of coarse grain model, there's all kinds of other details you could put in, you're, you're ignoring some of them, and you'll apply the procedure I just gave you. Uh, causally connected if and only if they're correlated, reach conclusions about the causal structure, and you might feel, well, that's going to be misleading if you've left out some variables, and that can, that can happen. So, imagine you have something telling you, telling you that A and B aren't correlated, both correlated with, with C, that determines this, this causal structure. Uh, but suppose in reality what's going on is there's some D that's causing both B and C. That will give you just the same correlations looking at the subset A, B and C, but it'll be misleading in that it will be telling you that B is causing C when in truth it isn't. So if you leave out common causes of two of the variables in your model, you're liable to get the wrong conclusions. But, provided you do include all the common causes of the variables in your model, then any conclusions you reach will be secure and not be overturned by including further variables. And, and intuitively think of it like, like this. Uh, what we've got here is a spurious correlation between B and C. A correlation that's not indicating a uh, 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 causal influence from B to C. And that's because they're both effects of a common cause. But in truth, B can only get to be spuriously correlated with C if it's self-correlated with one of the other causes of C. 
So if you stick in all the common causes of the variables in your model, the causal structure you get will be, will be robust to, to further investigations. And of course this is crucial to survey research. I mean, these techniques have been used for more than 100 years by epidemiologists and horticulturalists and uh, econometricians and uh, uh, they're very powerful te uh, social scientists generally, educational sociologists and, and they look at a subset of the variables influencing the effects they're interested in. And I mean, look, take smoking and cancer, right? Uh, so this kind of research has convinced us that smoking is a cause of cancer. But of course we haven't ever in our surveys, in our studies, looked at all the different factors that can influence cancer. But what we have done, is so we looked at all, I mean the cigarette companies have damn, made, damn well made sure, we've looked at all the factors that could, dang, we can't be certain, but we've, we've made a, a good effort to identify all the factors that could possibly be a common cause of smoking and cancer, and anxiety genes and so on, uh, 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 atmospheric pollution, and, and checked that they aren't producing a spurious correlation. And once we're convinced that all the common causes have been taken into account, then we feel secure that smoking really is a cause of cancer. Clock, I need to keep an eye on the clock. Okay, sometimes you can have a bunch of correlations that don't identify unique causal structure. As here, I mean, the, the, the correlations I started off with ruled out this, but left us with these three possibilities. But here's a fact, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, you can prove it as a theorem, it's pretty, pretty trivial. There will always be some wider set of possible variables and possible correlations between them that will decide a unique causal structure on the uh, uh, between the variables you started with. So, uh, as here, I mean, bringing, bringing in D and f noting it was, it was 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 uncorrelated with with B uh, uh, showed us the the unique causal structure. Okay. Yeah. What is the theorem again? The theorem is 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 that for any set of correlated variables. Maybe that the correlations between those variables do not determine a unique causal structure involving those variables. There will always be some wider set of variables and possible correlations between them that will determine a unique causal structure for the variables you started off with. And it's, it's, it, it's proved by Gleamore, Shinies and Spurties somewhere in the big, big fact causation prediction and search. I can't remember the reference, but yeah. It's, it's, it's not surprising. It's not surprising. Uh, because it's, it's, it's quite a... Uh, we claim there's always some set of wider variables, some correlations between them. Uh, the crucial thing, as I said earlier, that, that, that does a lot of the work here is is finding independent variables, not conditionally independent, absolutely independent variables, uh, and concluding that they are causally independent. Uh, that with respect to variables that they themselves are correlated with their exogenous variables. Uh, if you suppose that in reality any effect always has a plurality of independent causes. So now I'm not talking about possible extra variables, I'm supposing that in reality uh, anything that's an effect has has two causes, two different causes that are themselves probabilistically independent, then there's a very neat reduction of causal order to, to correlational facts that I get from Dan Hausman's very fine book, Causal Asymmetry. And he says, given, given a correlated A and B, you might wonder, well, is A a cause of B or B a cause of A, or what, are they both effects of a common cause? He says A is a cause of B if and only if. Everything correlated with A is correlated with B, and something correlated with B isn't correlated with A. So think about it, here's A, here's B, and the thought is, look, well, what's correlated with A? Well, the causes of A are correlated with A, 
and if A is a cause of B, then they'll be correlated with B. And the effects of A are correlated with A, and if that's a common cause structure, they'll be correlated with B. But if B is an effect of A, there'll be something else correlated with B that isn't correlated with A. So that's, that's, the, that's the picture. So, this will come up, and yeah? is any, no matter how gerrymandered set, I guess not. I mean, uh, so there's some restrictions on what counts as the set of eligible properties. That you I'm not sure what I what I want to say in response to that. I've now come away from mathematics, and I'm kind of appealing to a kind of metaphysical picture of, of reality, I mean, a picture of reality, how, 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 how the correlations are arranged vis-a-vis -vis causes and effects. And I'm not sure I should worry about gerrymandered properties because I guess I'm inclined to suppose that you won't find real population correlations between such gerrymandered properties. Uh, these, these, these correlations are kind of supposed to be law-like connections between, between types of properties. I mean, property types, I mean. I see, so it's only the properties that are lawfully, that are lawfully that whose correlations derive from laws that are eligible for the means of the means. I was afraid you could always find a common cause There are specific issues. I mean, there's, there's, there's a bit of literature on how if you, it, there's, there's specific places where you have to rule out gruesomeness. Uh, so, here's something. Frank, this is a point of Frank Alzinius's. So, he, you might say, look, here's. A common cause of A and B. Now you might you might want to analyze that. Think of this as, as having a statistical signature that that A and B are correlated. C's uh, screens it off. And here's here's the thing you might want to think. Look, whenever you find a, a probabilistic fork like that, A and B screened off by C, it'll never be the case that C is later than both A and B. And Frank Onzenius says, well, look, just, just think of it in terms of phase space, right? If, if you take, take the kind of uh, phase space shadow of, of this event, the set of, set of microstates, there'll be, there'll be something down here. But the natural thing, so, so that messes up the idea that, that forks always point in a certain way in time. The natural thing to say is, look, now this is going to be one of those funny, funny events in phase space, not a kind of event that we're, we're familiar with. So, so there's a point where you have to rule out. But it'll be lawfully connected to cities. Yeah, yeah. No, quite. So, no, so good. We, we, I'm going to have to have some restrictions on, on what kinds of properties. Harry? Um, what's, what's the mean? I'm wondering about this, this, this end clause here, phrase here. Something correlated with B isn't correlated with A. Why is that necessary in order for A to be a cause of B? Okay, well, my thought is. that's what it is for B to be an effect of A. It's to be something that's correlated with A and which is associated with something that's not associated with A. So, so my thought is, look, okay, you might say, look, what's, what's the status of these assumptions, basically, that you get uh, uh, causal connection if and only if you have correlations? And And one thought is that what it is for there to be a causal structure of this kind between the variables we're talking about is for them just to be associated by law-like correlations in this way. That, that, that causal structure just is correlational structure. It's a metaphysical reduction of causation to, to correlation. And I think that there's a very powerful argument for supposing that must be the right way to think about it. So it's not, it's not, it's not, 
so somehow first of all you have the fact that 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 b is a b is an effect and then there's a question as to what brings it about that whenever you have an effect there's going to be some independent source of variation the thought is that's what makes it an effect it's an effect in virtue of the fact that uh, it, it's got things pointing into it, things associated with it, which are themselves uh, probabilistically independent. So the reason one might be worried about this yeah. is just saying, well, look, suppose it would turn out that yeah. a certain kind of cancer is only caused by smoking or by anything else. But what's possible? So, it's a metaphysical reduction, not a conceptual reduction. I mean, uh, so... So there's an there's a Oxford Readings of Philosophy edited by Tooley and Souza, and in the introduction they talk about David Lewis's theory of causal direction, which is not far away from this. Uh, it hinges on the asymmetry of determination. Uh, uh, any, any, I mean, it's a quite long story, but, but, but for him, you get causal structure out of counterfactual structure, you get counterfactual structure out of the fact that uh, there's an asymmetry of determination in the actual world. Uh, any event has uh, many independent future facts are uh, sufficient to uh, infer that earlier fact, but it's not the case that in the past there are many independent facts. So, and, and Thule and Sosa say, but that can't be right because I can imagine a world in which there's just one billiard ball comes along, hits into another one and moves off, and that would have causal structure, kind of factual structure, but it doesn't have this asymmetry of overdetermination. So, the natural thing to say is, look, you can imagine that. It's conceptually possible, but it's not really possible because causal structure really does depend on there being these kind of de facto-ish asymmetries in the actual world. The world in which doesn't have those asymmetries doesn't have causal structure. Uh, so you're imagining a metaphysical impossibility. So that's that's the that's the thought here, Paul. Mm -hmm. Now I say there's cause two that leaves that last clause off, and now I've got a reduction of cause sub one and cause sub two. What is it that makes cause sub one the relation to care about? Do you cause sub two again? Uh, so, 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 so the question, sorry, the, huh? Harry, 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 Harry asked the question, like, why did we need that extra clause at the end that something correlated with B isn't correlated with A. And now the rates of the claim is right, so we're doing this this reduction and say that's what that's what causation is. So yeah, we'll good. Give good. You that. We'll give you that. Okay. That's causation one. Okay. Now I'm gonna um, reduce causation two. And it's the it's this, you know, less restrictive notion that doesn't have that last clause and something correlated with B isn't correlated with A. And now let's have cause three Right. And, and so, so I'm not quite sure I, I get the thrust of it. So I, so, I, so, I, so I take it that we start off and you know, we're regular people, we're familiar with lots of instances of causation, right? And uh, you know, just like we're, you know, we're familiar with lots of instances of water. And now I come and I, I do some kind of serious investigation and, and uh, 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 statistical analysis and tests and surveys and so on and I say oh, I've, I've, I've figured out what's really going underneath in all the cases where normally we re recognize causation that's that's the nature of causation uh, you, you, you give me some some other metaphysical structure and you make no attempt to show that that's characteristic of all the cases where we identify causation I mean you've given me a metaphysical structure but why should I suppose that that's causation I mean I say what is H2O and, and you say, well, well, suppose I said water was, water was NaCl. What would be wrong with that? And I said, well, look, look I mean, you, you, you're not... You, but, but hang, hang on, you said yeah? the nature of causation. Yeah. But, but now, just like, you can go to the side of it, that 
if, if, it's, if the reduction in if the reduction picture is to say, look, all the roads are all these lawful correlations, mm -hmm. and now we tell you which of those counts causes, right? Then Harry's. I take it one way of just rephrasing re Harry's question is a slightly weaker condition will include all of your cases of causation. And ah. One question now as I read this is that if you, if, if you took correlation to or cause to, causation to, then yeah. it says A is a cause of B if and only if everything correlated with A is correlated with B. Uh, yeah. So look, here's, here's, all I'm doing here is drawing out a consequence of the stuff I had earlier, the Markov condition, the faithful condition, together with a metaphysical assumption about how much richness you have in reality. So, so I'm not... The additional cause yeah. might get you directionality of causation. The r that... Sure, sure. I mean, the, the, the so that's an answer to pause. Okay, all right. I mean, I, I mean, uh, but I took it that causation is 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 directional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. If you just, I mean, if, I mean, if you left that off, then what are they? Okay. Oops. So how's how long are we here? Forever. No, no. <laughs> In the no time limit. No, no. So, the, but, 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 what, what, like an like an hour, an hour and a half. Twenty-seven back to New York. And we, but we're going to have a food and drink. If you go on for too long, that's fine. I mean, I, let, let's let's aim to get done in in, in ninety minutes. And uh, and, and I, I don't mind interruptions. I, I, I just want to uh, know. Uh, I mean, we, we 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 can talk all the way through and finish. Get to get to the end. No, no, I I don't mind. Uh, but uh, I just want to be able to to manage it. Uh, Okay, here's, here's the, the thought that, that we're not just, from a metaphysical point of view, look, there's the, the causes and effects, the structure in there, and, and now here's, an, here's a, a kind of interesting extra thing about them. They, they manifest these coronational symptoms that we can use to identify the causes and effects. That's one way of thinking about it. That, that there'd still be causes and effects even without all this correlational structure but as it happens we're lucky enough to have the correlational structure which for some reason allows us to identify the causes and effects that's one way of thinking about it. The other way of thinking about it is that this is just the essence of causal, causal structure. And when I say causal structure I'm, I'm especially interested in the asymmetry of causation, the, the arrows. I mean if, if you weren't worrying about the arrows you could just work with lots of correlations. And, and I'm very attracted to the idea that this kind of probabilistic analysis is displaying the, the metaphysical nature of causation, the essence of causation. And the argument is that if you don't suppose that, then you've got this very surprising thing to explain, which there doesn't seem any obvious way of explaining. I mean, it, it seems to come out of thin air that as it happens, whenever you have a cause-effect uh, uh, relationship, the effect has lots of independent sources of variation, the cause doesn't. And uh, 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 why should that be unless it's built into the nature of causation? That's the thought. Okay, here's some comments. Uh, quickly, I'll just go through them, and then I want to get on to the, the, the action stuff. Uh, issues that come up if, if, if you want to develop this metaphysical program. I should say, and this is something I'm, I'd be curious about from the people who know the statistics computer science background more, the people who, who actually develop this stuff, very few of them are keen on seeing it as a reduction of causation. Judea Pill, very striking, striking example. Uh, uh, Jim Woodward, I mean the philosophers too. But there are people around, Barry and uh, uh, other philosophers of science who are rather keen on the idea that you should be able to reduce uh, causal facts to probabilistic facts and uh, and Barry and David David Albert and and others want to do it by looking to to thermodynamics the kind of probabilistic structures underlie thermodynamic asymmetry use that to explain counterfactuals use counterfactuals maybe to explain causation and 
I put to them that, that if you're interested in this business of somehow seeing causal structure as grounded in probabilistic facts, this is, this is a much quicker, cleaner way to do it. Okay, issues that come up, you want to do quite a lot of work to account for actual single case causation. So I've been talking about type causation, smoking causes cancers, and arrow for smoking cancer. Uh, what's that got to do with a particular instance of smoking cause a particular case of cancer? And there looks like quite a distance between them. In particular, it seems perfectly intuitive that, that, some, that smoking can cause cancer in the way that would be established by, by the, the correlational structures, yet some particular person smoke and not get, get cancer. Um, imagine that that various other metabolic factors are required to, uh, to get from smoking to cancer. They're not present in me. I smoke, I get cancer. Uh, it's not that my smoking caused cause my cancer. So you need to do some more work to explain how this approach will deal with those cases. Uh, there's quite a lot of stuff about uh, single case causation in the recent literature that appeals to these uh, 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 correlationally based causal structures not just to deal with that case, but also to deal with the cases that are such problems for David Lewis of preemption uh, and so on. Just an observation, a lot of people currently interested in the idea of causation being proportional, that uh, causation isn't just to do with basic uh, physical features, but to do with ways of categorizing uh, uh, setups that gives you the variables that maximally explain the effect variables. This fits very nicely with the approach I'm developing now. Uh, this kind of approach tends to work with what Mackey thinks of as a causal field. There's various background assumptions. You assume they're in place. I don't know, there's oxygen, that the, uh, 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 the the heat around here isn't too much. I mean, all kinds of things that, uh, that, that we're, we're living in a capitalist society and, and you hold those fixed and then you see how variables depend on others within that context. If you widen the context, things might become different. And I won't go into this now because I want to, to move on, but, but failures of faithfulness. Faithfulness was the idea that, that if you have two variables that are uncorrelated, that means there's no causal connection between them. That's a presupposition of this whole, this whole approach. But it's not clear why that should be metaphysically impossible as this approach applies. Because you can easily imagine ways in which you can get kind of cancelling out of causal influences. Look, drinking Coca-Cola fills me with caffeine, makes me exercise, uh, it fills me with sugar, makes me fat. The two things cancel out, so there's no correlation between, uh, uh, say, smoking and putting on weight. You infer that the, the sorry, smoking, drinking Coca-Cola and putting on weight, you infer drinking Coca-Cola and putting on weight are both causes of exercise, it comes out all wrong, uh, because you've got this kind of accidental cancelling out, and, and that's a real real puzzle, which... That doesn't seem like such a big problem, because it would be very sensitive to changes. So, yes indeed, and uh, it wouldn't be a practical problem. I mean, well, hang on, there's two levels. I mean, failures of faithfulness for, for real uh, empirical researchers is 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 a, is a, is a is a big problem because uh, because you aren't getting the exact correlations but are making estimates. Quite often, it will seem to you that there isn't a correlation, and you'll infer causal structure on that when in fact there's just a cancelling out of two causal influences. But from the metaphysical point of view, uh, it's not enough that this is terribly sensitive, and you always actually find out if you do more research. Uh, from a medical point of view, it's got to be downright impossible that in the actual world there should be no cancelling out. And it's not clear what entitles you to that. So I think one has to move back a little bit from the correlations to something a bit deeper to, to ensure the impossibility. Okay, let me move on to the second, second half. Well, I'm moving towards it. What's this got to do with action, intervention, control, manipulation, and so on. 
I haven't said anything about anything like that, and particularly I haven't said anything about interventions, which is uh, how this approach to causation in the philosophical literature is now referred to. It's called the interventionist approach to causation. I'm not going to say anything about actions for a moment, but let me, let me explain something else. Suppose you've got some, some uh, causal model. You've got a lot of kind of A's and B's and C's and D's and arrows between them and so on. And, uh, and you're wondering, let's suppose you've got uh, a C, an E, and an A, and uh, I don't know, you just got, just got this, say. And you're wondering how much does C affect E? And, I mean, let's suppose there's some stuff up here, I mean, maybe A is causing C, or C is causing A, or they have a common cause, there's some correlation here. But you want to know how much is C, C causing E? Uh, what's the example I'm going to use in a minute? Now, I'll, I'll, I'll draw that again, again differently. Uh, and this might be a practical thing. You, you, you might be interested in, in, in uh, using this for some kind of social policy. You, you, you're going to influence C to... You, you want to know how, 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 how strong is the influence of C on E? Okay. What you don't want to do in order to assess that is to look at the unconditional correlation between C and E. Because if there's some other effect of E that C is correlated with, the unconditional correlation with C and E will be swollen by this influence in, and, and C's correlation with A. So what you have to do is you look at the conditional probability, you look at the partial regression coefficients, you look at look at cases where we got A and see how much difference C makes to E there. And look at cases where we haven't got A and see how much difference C makes to E there. And then take the weighted average of the two cases weighted by the probability of A and the probability of not A. That seems, that, that seems logical, right? And that, that, that's What you don't want to do is weighted by uh, the probability of A given C. You want to weight it by the probability of A. Weight it by the probability of A given C, you're just going to get the, you're just going to get the unconditional correlation back again. So that's how you work out how much C is influencing E. And In effect, that's to work out what correlation you would get in a structure, which was just like this structure, save that C and A were probabilistically independent. You're looking at the, the correlation between C and E, which is the correlation, the difference C makes to E given A, weighted by the probability of A, given the difference C makes D given not a weight by probability of A, and you're doing that rather than the difference C makes D weighted by the probability of, of A given C. So you're shifting from a case where uh, A and C are to a case where A and C are uncorrelated and seeing what the difference would be would be there. Now, in effect, this is this is to Imagine you've shifted from the actual structure to a, so a structure where C, as it said, is produced by an intervention. Okay, now I've put intervention in, in scare quotes and italics and comic sans as well. Just to make it clear that so far, we're just talking about a different structure in which C is produced in some way that decorrelates it from A. Nothing to do with actions or humans or anything yet. And in fact, it's just, it's just a graphic way of referring us to the sum that we do, which is to work out the difference C makes D given A, not A, weighted by the probabilities of A and not A. And uh, I want to say 
This is nothing yet to do with action or anything, it's just how much different C makes stay. That's the information that's already there in the, the, the graph. Or The graphs actually are, are graphic representations of what standardly is a more informative structure that could be written down. Structural equations will have numbers and uh, uh, a lot more information. Okay, so now we're getting onto human beings and actions. They haven't, look, they haven't, they haven't come in yet, and in particular, they haven't come in with that damn Comic Sans interventions. And now we're going to be talking about decision theory, causal decision theory, evidential decision theory, and so on. Here's something that, that's true. Rational agents will do A in pursuit of R if and only if A causes R. Uh, think about it, causes R is important to me. It's not true rational agents do A in pursuit of R if and only if A is correlated with R because there could be all kinds of silly spurious correlations, causations. Uh, what you need there. Now, what's the status of P? Here's one way of looking at it. And this is, this is the way I like. Causation is a basic thing here. Causation is kind of metaphysical feature of reality. I've, I've, we've been talking about, we've, we've understood now kind of what aspects of reality constitute causation. And and we're causal beings, and we've evolved in a causal, a causal world. And, uh, in fact, we've been designed to uh, do all kinds of thinking, enable us to cause results that are good for us. And, uh, and that's why, why P is true. Causation is basic, and it's, uh, it's a kind of consequence of being, beings like us, that we ought to, ought to avail ourselves of it when we're trying to... Uh, trying to act. So the right hand side of P explains the left hand side. Metaphysically, that's what it is to be a rational agent. Normatively, that's what rational agents ought to do. And conceptually, uh, the concept of rational agent means somebody who, who acts on causes and not and other kinds of connections. Okay. And the rest of us, the rest of us, I'm going to try and give a hard time to people who want to run this uh, equivalence in the other direction. They want to somehow cast light on the nature of causation by reference to the fact that rational agents uh, do A in pursuit of R to the extent that A causes R. So, I'm going to distinguish in what, what goes on here two, two different aspects of this, two different thoughts. One's a conceptual thought. It's that our conceptual hold on causation goes via the notion of rational, rational agent. That uh, There are all kinds of correlations in the world. I mean, uh, lots of them. You, you, with these graphs, we, 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 we can imagine the, the, the links are, are uh, just correlations, all kinds of correlations. And now we're kind of distinguishing some of the, some of the correlations with arrows. Those are the causal correlations. And, and you might wonder, well, where do we get What's our thinking when we, we pick out those as distinguished? And one thought is, well, we pick out those as distinguished because those are the ones that rational agents uh, uh, should, should act on. So there's a conceptual idea that, 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 that we fix reference to the causal correlations opposed to other ones via the idea they're the ones that rational agents will act on. Here's a second thought, and, and a rather more ambitious thought that by running this equation from left to right the 
we can explain why it's good to act on causes. Here's a perspective. Here we've got all these connections and now we've drawn some arrows and now P says, well, rational agents should should be guided by the arrows and not by the connection. You might wonder why. What's, what, what, why is that such a good idea? Rational agents want R. Why, is, why if you want R, is it a good idea to be guided by the arrows? And some people would like to be able to show that if you act on the arrows, then you'll get R. That's good for getting R. Uh, and uh, maybe people who act on causes are will we'll get results more often than people who don't act on causes. That, that, that's, that, that would be very nice if you could show it. Uh, it's it's uh, a justification of acting on causes in terms of the thought that you want, you want the results. You might think, well, isn't that going to work? It, that's not going to work as it happens. Uh, earlier I said, well, there's the conceptual normative and metaphysical. I'm going to leave the metaphysical to one side because nobody really wants to use the notion of rational agency to give a metaphysical account of causation. Uh, because of course there's causation over in uh, uh, black holes and places where there's no, there's no agents and so on and, and you want the, the structures that constitute causation to be uh, extend beyond cases where they're, they're agents. But still that leaves it possible to, to say we understand the concept of causation via thinking of rational agents and we uh, can explain why it's a good idea to act on causes uh, in terms of thinking of rational agents. Okay, now if we're going to explain which correlations are causal as those that rational agents act on. And if we're going to justify being guided by uh, the causal connections, by that's what rational agents will do, we're going to need a notion of rational agent that is prior to the notion of causation. You can't just say a rational agent is somebody who uh, does A in pursuit of R just in case A causes R, if you're trying to explain things causal in terms of a notion of a rational agent. So I'm now going to look at various ways of trying to develop a notion of a rational agent that doesn't, doesn't presuppose the notion of causation. Okay, I've got here some quotes from Allison Thomas and Jim Woodward, uh, which basically are examples of the normative idea. They're going to give an analysis that will explain to us why it's a good idea to act on causes in terms of something else. Uh, is, that, is that Thomas? Of that's, that's from Thomas's thesis. That's his last name. Did I spell it wrong? Yeah. Well, what's, what's his name? <laughs> is, 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 have I got it completely wrong? Is it not even close? Not even close. <laughs> it's Blanchard. Of course it is. Who's Thomas Predu? No, another, another philosopher. <laughs> There's philosophy of science at University of Bordeaux. Complete glitch. I mean, I... I, 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 uh, and I was telling you about the problems I had with property. That's really weird. So I'm, I'm, well, I'm, uh, Thomas, I'm really sorry. Uh, okay, uh, so these are all people are going to explain uh, uh, rational agency without bringing the notion of causation and thereby explain why it's a good idea to act on causes. Okay, how, how are you going to do this? Okay, here's, here's one, one attempt. And this is kind of basically what Jim Woodward. Kind of, he doesn't really think this because he's smart enough to realize it doesn't work, but, but early on he was very attracted by this. Uh, so here the idea is, look, causal correlations are ones that 
aren't spurious, they, 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 they stay there when C is produced by an intervention. Uh, C is really a, a cause of E if when C results from an intervention there's still some correlation between C and E. The correlation between C and E isn't just due to C's association with A which is an independent cause of E. So you might go from that that causal correlations are those that stay there when C is produced by an intervention to the idea that uh, those cor causal correlations are those that are stable invariant under efforts to use C to control E. They're, they're, they're the kind of correlations that will support manipulations. This is actually a terrible idea and, and this is uh, crucial to understanding why interventionism isn't really interventionism. Uh, let's take a real life example now. Suppose We've, we've got parents, they're choosing to send their children to private schools or, or state schools, and what they're interested in is good exam results. And so, let me try and draw it. So you've got type of school, you've got exam results. Suppose there's a correlation between them. The, the, the private schools have better exam results. And so it looks like private school. I mean, that's, that's what you might think. But suppose that, that in truth, it's to do with parental income. Uh, being rich influences whether you go to private school and being rich lots of books at home and so on, influences good exam results. Suppose, suppose, I mean, let's keep it simple, that there really isn't any causal connection there. Okay. Now, you might think that here if the school was produced by an intervention if it was produced in a way it decorrelated it from the parental income then then there wouldn't be any correlation here but it doesn't follow that when a rich person sends their child to a private school that that's a matter of intervening in reality because it's not true that when a rich person sends their child to private school their decision is independent probabilistically of other causes of good exam results it's very much influenced by how much money they've got you're much more likely to send your child to private school if you're rich so There's a kind of equivocation here you need to watch out for. I mean, in everyday sense, the, 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 the parents are intervening on their children's education uh, with the hope of getting good exam results. But what happens isn't an intervention in the technical sense. It's not that, that somehow their decision has been decorrelated from the other causes of good exam results. And put it like this, among the the you you put you and your child into the category of going to private schools you're now in a category that's correlated with good exam results the correlation spurious but it's still a perfectly genuine correlation, you've rendered yourself, and use this terminology, you've rendered your child the kind of child who's going to get good exam results, in the sense that you've rendered your child a child at uh, 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 
uh, private school, and going to private school is correlated with good exam results. So, it's not a causal connection in the sense it's not a correlation that would r remain there if this was produced by a comic sans intervention, but it is a genuine correlation in the sense it remains there when uh, a parent intervenes to send their child to private school. So, the correlations that, s that stay there when people act aren't all causal. The keen parents render themselves the kind of agents most likely to get good results, but it's not a causal correlation, nor is it one that's good to act on. So if you want to run the line that acting on causal correlations renders you the kind of agents you might need to get good exam results, what you need to show is that real rational interventions are genuine interventions in a technical sense. What you need to show is that the decision to send your child to private school is genuinely independent of the other causes of the desired effect. And I, I like to think in terms of, of actions that are other cause independent, that, that, are, that are really interventions in the technical sense. So if you could do that, if you could show that actions were really other cause independent, then you could show that people who act on causes really are likely to get, get the results they want. Now there's a bunch of people who argue like this. Hugh Price is one and Chris Hitchcock is another. And they say, when we deliberate, when we're thinking about whether to send our child to pub public or private school or anything like that, we can't help but think of our actions as independent of the other results. It's kind of the perspective of an agent makes you think of yourself as somebody who's, who's acting in a way that's independent of anything else that influences the outcome. You, you have to think of yourself as a kind of super free agent. Not somebody who's just compatible as free, but somebody who's really free. You aren't influenced at all by any of the other things that affect, affect the result. Uh, and they say, well look, I mean, think about how you do the sum, right? You figure out uh, uh, how much is this going to influence that by uh, imagining how much difference this would make to that if it was decorrelated from that. I mean, if you know all the statistics, what you start thinking is, well, how much difference do the schools make among rich parents? How much schools do the rich make among the poor parents? Uh, uh, average by uh, whether uh, the probability of being rich or poor. And, uh, and you do the sum that we did over here. And so Price and Hitchcock say, well, we act under the pretense that we are super free agents, that, that our actions are independent of the causes of desired results. I don't think that that really makes much sense. There's another way of thinking about what we're doing. We think about how much difference this makes to that on the subjects independent of that, because that's a good way of working out how much causal difference this makes to that, and that's what we want to act on. I mean, in truth, we don't think that after we've acted that uh, we're we're going to have this correlation result because we think that our choices aren't actually independent of other, other causes of the result. Uh, but we act on that pretense because that's a good way of working out the causal influence on the result. And you might ask uh, uh, Hitchcock and Price, well given that you don't think that in reality uh, th that this is a pretense, that we can't help but think in this way even though uh, we know it's not the case, 
Why are we thinking this way? Why are we acting under the pretense we know to be false? Given there's another alternative explanation of what we're doing, which is working out the causal influence of our action on the result. Here's a third attempt. This kind of appeals to a principle of total evidence. So, the thought is, look, somebody who's thinking about the, the choice of schools isn't just thinking of them as maybe a random parent from the the population that has rich and poor parents and in which there's this this spurious correlation uh, between well there's, there's a genuine but possibly spurious correlation between schools and exam results they will know whether they're rich or poor so they won't be interested in the statistics as average over rich or poor parents they'll be interested in statistics for rich parents or alternatively for poor parents. They'll put themselves in a narrow reference class. And of course, if they look at the statistics of that reference class, then the correlation will disappear. Among the rich parents, the schools don't make any difference. And among the poor parents, the schools don't make any difference. So, the thought is that once you note that agents will know about themselves enough to put themselves into a reference class, where spurious correlations disappear, where they really are other, uh, other cause independent, then we can say that uh, the causal correlations will line up with the correlations that remain, that people who act on causes will be likely to get good results. So here, this is in the ballpark of tickle defences. Those of you who know this literature, the, the, the people who defend the possibility of explaining rational agency without bringing in causation say that we don't have to worry about spurious correlations because agents will always know enough about themselves to put themselves in a reference class where the correlations left are never spurious. Now there's two problems here. Standard one, we worry about do agents really always have this knowledge? But I want to finish with another problem, and this is the problem of whether decisions are always fixed by deliberations alone. So, I want to look at this case. Maybe somebody wants to avoid cancer, well, that's, that's, that's natural enough. The smoker, I suppose it's a hidden chemical that inclines you to smoke but in truth smoking doesn't cause cancer look here's here's the diagram you your 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 beliefs your desires affect your decision whether or not to smoke there's a chemical that's also pushing you towards smoking and the chemical causes causes cancer so your choice depends on your deliberations and the chemical and the chemical doesn't influence you your choice via your deliberations so now, even if you know all about, about yourself, your beliefs and desires, your deliberations, that's a reference class in which there'll still be a spurious correlation between your decision and getting cancer. If you choose to smoke, that's evidence that you'll get cancer, even though the smoking doesn't cause cancer, because it's some evidence that you've got the chemical. Should you stop smoking in order to avoid cancer? If you look at the diagram, clearly, clearly not. Smoking doesn't have any influence on cats. You, if you're enjoying smoking, you may as well go on smoking. But look, by stopping smoking, you'll render yourself somebody who's less likely to get cancer. You'll put yourself in a reference class of people who don't smoke. Ah, ah. That's, that's probabilistic evidence they have, that you're in the class that has a chemical, probability evidence that you'll get, get cancer. So, but the other way around, if, if, if you stop smoking, it's evidence you don't have the chemical, evidence you, you uh, don't have cancer. 
So that's a case where it looks like you still can't explain the rationality of acting on causes in terms of this is the kind of thing that's most likely to give you what you want. So let's go back to the two aims that people had when they were trying to explain causation in terms of rational agent. One, one was a conceptual one, you were trying to fix reference to uh, uh, the causal correlations by looking at what rational agents acted on. And the second was a normative idea, well I've got them other way around. Uh, the second was the, uh, the conceptual one, why do we pick out certain correlations? The normative one, why is it a good idea to act on causes? Both of these noted a, a, need a notion of rational agent that isn't just agent who does A in pursuit of A just in case A in pursuit of R just in case A causes R. Well you might think we've got quite close to that notion now. Take an agent who's not only self-knowing, they can, they can always put themselves in a reference class defined by uh, all the facts that are influencing their, their choices, but is also continent in the sense that it's their, it's their deliberations that determine their actions. So they're not, they're not like this person. Now I think that that notion is arguably not a causal notion, the notion of an agent who's self-knowing and continent, whose actions are fixed by their deliberations and nothing else. So I'm not against the idea that we can think of our kind of conceptual hold on causation as explained by the correlations that such an agent will act on. That seems to me an idea that works. Causal correlations are the correlations that self-knowing continent agents act on. It kind of works, but I'm not sure I'm convinced that it's the right account of how we fix reference to the notion of cause. A lot of other stuff we know about causation. We know about causation, it's what's going on when billiard balls bump into each other. It's what we can infer from various kinds of statistical, statistical structures. Uh, maybe part of it is, part of our hold on the notion of causation is what rational agents act on. Uh, uh, I don't especially want to dispute that. It doesn't seem to me terribly exciting actually. Uh, uh, the, more, the more interesting idea would be if you can explain uh, why it's good to act on causes by saying that's the kind of action that's best suited to get you, get you desired results. But I don't think where we've got to supports that. And here I want to go back to something that, that, that David Lewis said a long time ago. He said, shouldn't we worry about what choices would be rational for partly rational agents? Either because, uh, I'll do it the other way, I can't tell the strength of his beliefs and desires, either it isn't self-knowing, or because he's con incontinent, or because, either because his choices are influenced by something beside his beliefs and desires. So, The people who want to explain causation in terms of agency, and in particular explain why it's a good idea to act on causes in terms of agency, want to say, look, that's the kind of action that will make you the kind of agent who's most likely to get good results. And that will work for agents who are self-knowing and continent. Who, who can put themselves in a narrow reference class and their actions are, are determined by the, by the liberations and nothing else. But the trouble is that this line of thought leaves out the incontinent deliberators. It doesn't explain why the incontinent deliberator should act on causes. I mean, this person shouldn't give up smoking. 
to uh, avoid cancer, even though giving up smoking will put them in the category of people who are likely not to get cancer. Uh, and you can't explain why this person uh, should carry on smoking without referring to brutally, brutally causal facts. Uh, you might think this person's in a mess. Uh, this person really is in a bit of a mess. They aren't really in control of their actions. But still, their beliefs and desires are having some influence on their actions, and they ought to do it in the right way. And this person really oughtn't to, knowing all this causal structure, give up, give up smoking in order to avoid cancer. But uh, the, the story we've been given at the moment does not, does not explain, explain why not this person, uh, their action of giving up smoking uh, makes them less likely to get cancer. So, if you want to explain what's rational for the incontinent agent, you've got no choice but to, to explain that in terms of causal structures. So, in the end, we can't explain why it's good to act on causes by saying people who act on causes are most likely to satisfy their desires. Sometimes rationally, rationality, acting on causes, requires you to render yourself the kind of person who isn't likely to get rich, isn't likely to satisfy their desires, is likely to get, to get cancer. Uh, and so the truth is that you've got to explain rationality in terms of causation. You can't, you can't explain the rationality of acting on causes in terms of something else. Okay, that's what I will say. All right? So I think it makes a big difference whether the probability relation we're talking about are among types or tokens. Mm -hmm. I think if you take them to be tokens, the problems that you're pointing out will go away. Um, so think about the school Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that example, the liberator, mm -hmm. is trying to decide between sending the kids to the school mm -hmm. or not. So it's the decision mm -hmm. we're looking at. Mm -hmm. The probabilities that are important is the conditional probability of deciding to send the kid to the school and everything else that's outside of his head or the probability of this deciding not to send the kid to school and everything that's outside of his head. And that will give a probability in this particular case of this kid getting ready for bad news. It might be very hard to figure out what that probability is, but if, as you mentioned, I do believe in the new probabilities of all of this stuff, there will be probabilities that those so probabilities. If that probability is higher, um, it will be Okay. Here's I mean this this is a oh god the modern world. I, who's got a coin? We don't have no coins anymore. It doesn't matter. I'll pretend I've got a coin. I'll pretend I've got a coin, right? No, no, it's, 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 we'll just do it with an imaginary coin, right? Yeah. yeah. So how do American coins work? You got heads and tails? Heads and tails? Okay. So what's the right odds to bet on heads, right? If I, I have no idea. Suppose, 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 suppose I, I no, it's, it's a regular coin. And uh, look, the point is clear enough. Right? So I'll, 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 I'll give you uh, my $2 to your one if you uh, guess, guess right. And, uh, so your thought is that the, the, the probabilities relative to your choice are the actual probabilities determined by everything, including everything outside your head, which makes, makes this one or naught. No, it doesn't. Ah, why not? Um. So, so I, I, I have a really because deep, deep 
disagreement here. So I think the right probabilities to guide your actions are those relative to your knowledge, defined by the type probabilities in the reference class you know yourself to be in. And that, and that, I think uh, and, and, and the right probabilities. Ah. Of course, I can only act on probabilities that I know or believe, and so they'll be right in one sense. On the other hand, in yeah. the world, there are these other probabilities that determine in a deeper way the right ones, just like in the case of I may have certain, I only act on my beliefs, and I might be wrong about them. Really well, why, why are you stopping with the probabilities? Why not just look? So, so you, you offer me your two pounds to my one if uh, I, can, I, I, I can guess right, uh, well, I mean, uh, which way the coin lands and uh, so Can you have your two pounds to my one, which I'll win if the coin lands heads, right? And I think that's a good bet, so I take it, right? Then the coin lands tails. So, so I made the wrong choice. Uh, it was irrational for me to... That seems wrong. I, I wasn't uh, interested in characterizing rationality. Ah. So that's what I was interested in. Right, so I was, I was saying that the, the, there are token probabilities here, and acting on those token probabilities is the right thing to do. Those token probabilities are what give rise to the causal structure. So I think causes are relations to token events. But let's not worry about Tyson. So you have in mind the relevant probabilities are the probabilities fixed by all the features of the situation, not just the ones I know about. Is that what you're thinking? So, so if, de if determinism is true, all the probabilities are 0 and 1? No. no. That's not what you're saying. These are conditional probabilities, and we conditionalize this. When we, we conditionalize on the macro state of the, the <coughs> There is a notion of macro state of the universe. We conditionalize on that. I don't start saying we, we do that. But that's what we're aiming for. Because that's sort of the information. That's but Barry, why, why are you pulling this? Uh, I mean, th there's the probabilities relative to all the detailed including the micro facts there's the probabilities which I, I don't think those are the right things to act on nor do you there's the probabilities relative to what i know about the situation and now you've got something yeah, in between but that just seems to me pulled out of a hat i mean you can say that's what you want to so so what's so good about them as opposed well, to the probabilities the given by everything? That, that was the kind of question Paul was asking. Right? Yeah. Okay, no. But so... I do think this is going to happen because I do think that if you act... When, when we make decisions, mm -hmm. we think of our decisions as just affecting microstates. That's why they seem to us to be free. I mean, I don't uh, want to change it from the but... So... That the way you were approaching the whole discussion of causation, mm. yeah. which I'm completely on board with and wish you were exactly yeah. well, that yeah. you're going to characterize causation in terms of the probabilistic structure of the world. I'm totally with that. Mm -hmm. But from the beginning, you were doing it with respect to type causation, whereas I would have done it with respect to token causation, I would want to do it like that. And that okay. seems to be the interacted with your mm -hmm. criticisms, the criticisms you're making, the agency accounts. Um, I guess I think that mm. the agency account does mm. do the two things. I'm not sure about this, but like you were saying, is to be Morales and mm -hmm. Thomas did work on this area. It did give some reason to go along with the um, uh, idea that there's a, we pick out this particular stru probabilistic structure because of its role in the decisions to get us. Really nice too if I could figure out the argument that it's 
so I agree it's a bit tricky I mean in response to Paul's question earlier about what would be wrong with a different metaphysical reduction of causation I mean there I felt that's fine we've got a pretty good pre-theoretical pre hold on causation we don't understand nature but we, we, we know where the causes are uh, when it comes to rationality under conditions of uncertainty I think I think our thinking is much much less uh, clear-cut and which are the right probabilities to to fix what's the rational choice I mean should they be single case probability should they be your uh, uh, not single case but possibly unknown but macroscopic probabilities yeah, so, as it happens in in this debate curiously everybody takes it to be the probabilities in the reference classes defined by your knowledge of yourself uh, for better or worse that's how it goes so both the causal decision theorists and the evidential decision theorists are working on that assumption I think I think they're quite right I mean Helen Beebe and I have a paper saying that you can explain all the cases if you take that to be the primitive principle of which kind of probabilities you ought rationally to act on and if you take any of the other options you're going to get a lot of cases you can't explain so uh, but we could talk about it more Paul? I just want to ask what I think is the flip side of this question so am I right when you when you use the language render yourself mm -hmm. to someone who's less likely to yeah. answer yeah. that shorthand for something like Render yourself an instance of a type. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. And, yeah, and, and since render, in my ear, sounds like a causal emotion, can you say a little more about what it is to render yourself an instance of a type? So, maybe I should try and get some different terminology here. It does, it, in terms of the exposition, I don't think it matters that render sounds causal because, because the, the effect is being a member of that type. So I, I. Yeah, but, uh, so, 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 but I guess the question is, is rendering? Yeah, the, 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 is that a one-off? No, no. There are more types. So, so, so look. Right I'm rendering my kid somebody <laughs> who's at a private school. Uh, and it doesn't matter too much for my argument if that's illegitimately causal. That's that's not that's not where the action is. The question is, am I uh, uh, causing him to get good exam results? Uh, looks like no, given that structure. But I am causing him to be a member of a class, a type that is genuinely correlated with good exam results. That, that was the thought I'm getting. So you're rendering yourself somebody who is likely to get good exam results in that sense. I'm, I'm, I'm fixing, causally if you like, that you're, you're at a private school and thereby putting yourself in the category of kids who more often get good exam results than the kids at other schools. I mean, that, that, that's, 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 that's all that terminology was supposed to... And, and the point is, is, is that... Uh, The people who want to explain rationality in terms of, without bringing in causation, want to try and identify the, the connections to act on, just in terms of that business of rendering yourself a member of a type that's correlated with certain results, just uh, 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 brutally correlated. So yeah, I mean, so I, I render my kid a member of the bunch of kids who get good exam results. I mean, yeah, I'm sending him to private school. They all get good good exam results. Uh, I I render myself the kind of person who's less likely to get cancer by not smoking. I mean, I'm, ca I'm causing myself to not smoke. I'm not causing myself to. Uh, not get cancer, but I'm putting myself in the class of people, the non-smokers, who get cancer less often. Yeah? Suppose the probability of 
um, your particular the person you imagine with this kid uh, getting good grades is actually lower if you put it into the school. Let's suppose there's a, there is there's a case. Out, and that, let's suppose there's a, it's a Simpsons paradox case, right? It might yeah. be easier for yeah. you to think about it like that. So they're really indeterministic. Yeah. And suppose that the probability uh, on this particular occasion of putting your kid in a mm -hmm. school that is getting better grades would be lower than if you didn't put it in school then you might not put him in the school in a sensible way. So, here's a device that makes quantum mechanical coins. So it sells the quantum mechanical device. 50% 50, 50 of the time, 50% chance it makes a 8% head bias coin, 50% of the time it makes a 8% tails bias coin. And now I'm going to spin one of these coins and what, what, what should be the odds you have in mind? Uh, you don't know which kind of coin it is, I mean, I, but you just know that's the setup. I say obviously you ought to have a 50% chance you would have a 50% credence of heads, even though the chance is either 80% or 20%. It uh, doesn't seem to me right that in respect of choices and betting behavior that if you bet at 50%, you've done it wrong because it's either 80% or 20%. Quite. Okay, look. And just like it might be that you might have good reason to think that if you eat this, okay. eat this water, you know, quench your thirst, um, but actually the water contains poison. That's right. But, but if, if you're... Look, there's always going to be two senses of right and wrong here. And most obviously, there's always going to be a post hoc sense where if you chose an action which didn't get the right result, you bet with the odds, it's a 90% chance you offered, uh, you, you offered a, 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 a better, better even, so it's, it's a sure thing, right? But the horse doesn't come home, right? You, you made an absolutely rational thing, but it turned out wrong. So, uh, if you're going to insist on the perspective from which it's wrong unless you actually got Got no, the I'm money. Not, not no, no, you're not doing that. No, but, I'm, no, I'm but, insisting on there being this probability. Yeah. But, but, but you're, but, guides, no, but, but, but rational not rational. I'm, I'm putting to you, it's just as, it's just as, uh, misplaced to criticize the rationality because out there there's some probability different from the one you're acting on. It's just as misplaced to criticize the rationality as it is to criticize the rationality on the grounds that it didn't turn out to be the right answer. You lack some knowledge that you could have had. Yeah, and you lack some knowledge you could have had about... about Whether it's irrational that, it depends on how hard it was for you to get that knowledge. So people would say, is the reason to believe that far off from the right ones because they, they could have conditionalized... But I, I just think it's kind of weird but think of the quantum mechanical two possibilities uh 80 20. there's a perspective from which you say if you bet a certain way and you didn't when you made the wrong choice you should have bet the other way but you say you don't want to have that perspective i mean that's kind of post hoc God's eye point of view, but, no, I think you but, 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 that's another perspective okay, too. yeah, I, I just don't see, the, I just don't see the, the argument for saying the, the unknown current uh, not single case, but thermodynamically determined probabilities 
are the ones you ought to act on, even if they're different from the one. They are single yeah. case, yeah. but they're not conditional on the whole micro state. Okay. Well, no, but th th there's no reason why mine shouldn't be just a single case as yours then. But uh, uh, so. Okay. Okay. Correlated with B, but not A. Yeah. That, that, sure, sure. There we are. So A is a positive. So uh, let's say there's two banks in town. Yeah. And uh, if I rob. Uh, one of them I can get a thousand dollars and that's the only way I'm going to get a thousand dollars. Yeah. So let A be that I'm going to get a thousand dollars. You want to get a thousand dollars. No, A is that I get a thousand dollars. You get a thousand dollars, yeah. And B is that I, ride, that, I, that I rob the bank on the north side of town. Yeah. So everything correlated with my having a thousand dollars, I guess, is somehow correlated with my robbing the bank. And, uh, you know, I'm more likely to rob the bank on the north side of town if I live on the north side of town. So that's something that's correlated with B that's not correlated with A. So it sounds like having $1,000 is the cause of robbing the bank on the north side of town. So let's, let's just, so getting $1,000 is A. Yeah. Robbing the north side of town is B. Yeah. And where you live is something else that... Well, I live on the north side of town, yeah. so that's correlated with my robbing the bank on the north side, so the south side might go down there. So, um, that seems to satisfy your definition. Let's see. Thousand. Uh, Rob North Bank. Uh, Live north. Okay. So I'm not sure everything correlated with this will be correlated with that, will it? Uh, Suppose you get migraines, when you get a migraine, you just give up on the robbery attempts, you go home, right? Uh, but, but, so, no, this all just looked... Uh, Just trying to think it through. You think the migraines will be associated with whether you rob the bank on the north side of town? Why? Uh, let me think of something else. What about? Like the police coming by in the course of the in the course of the robbery. So you're saying the only way you can get a thousand dollars is by robbing the bank. Robbing on the north side. Yeah, there's two banks. No, well, I'm robbing the bank. I mean, there's two banks I could rob. But, the, but I'm mean, saying I, the only way I can get a thousand dollars is by robbing the bank. So I'm looking I'm looking for something else that is correlated with this and not correlated with that. That will get me off the hook, right? Uh, yeah, but the only way I can get a thousand dollars is from a bank. 
There's only two banks. How about the police? The police come by, you know, and every so often they patrol, right? And if they come by, you know, I don't get a thousand dollars, but I'm still robbing the bank. No, no, I'm, my story is. Oh, so, so, you, so my the story is that I rob the bank, I get a thousand dollars. Oh, hang on, hang on. Okay. So one thing about all this causal modeling yeah. is you don't want to have events that are kind of constitutively tied up with each other. They've got to be able to vary independently. So if, if, if one event is part of another, you, everything goes haywire. Uh, so that's a condition it sounds like you're so making. So this theory of causality rules out one event making another event. It rules, it rules out regarding as, as distinct events, events that are metaphysically intertwined. So one is part of the other. And you, and you set it up so, so it's part of getting $1,000 that you robbed the bank. Well, I got two banks that you robbed, but either one I got $1,000. Yeah, uh -huh. that, that depends on the lies in I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. Uh, so, Isn't yeah. There's a funny thing about yeah. the condition. Mm -hmm. I think, if I understand it right, the total state of the universe at any time yeah. can't be said to cause the state at any other time. Sure. I'm not no, you, 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 making this an objection, just an interesting No, thing. no, I mean, the, look, so... Because there wouldn't be anything else that could be correlated with the Th th this is this is kind of I, su I suspect what I need to say in response to this kind of in order to discern these structures there's got to be noise there's got to be independent uh, things jiggling around uh, your events in such a way that you can see which variations go to which variations you've got to, you've got to have variations uh, and if everything is everything is put in as one variable there's nothing to vary uh, things have to vary independently. So, uh, freezing. Uh, huh? So, the freezing image doesn't cause uh, water, you know. So, low temperature doesn't cause water to freeze because that would happen for sure. So. Well, low, 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 low temperature. About that. You, you, you can you, introduce noise. There isn't. Yeah, but but you can have the temperature where I mean uh, outside you drop. Can't have a noise causing right. You can have a temperature, the air temperature uh, going down. The water doesn't freeze because there's a heating element in the water or something. If you say no, no, I'm talking about the temperature of the water. Now that's too close, right? The temperature of the water and the freezing of the water that's not going to vary independently because they're kind of tied up with each other metaphysically. You know, that's that's. I don't think the was that there has to be another way of something that's correlated with the effect, right? So yeah. It's not that A always brings about B. It's that, that that's not the problem. The problem is there would be a problem if there wasn't anything else that could be I think I think you're going to have to have types where you can have this present or absent, this present or absent, this present or absent. You, you, you've, got to, you've got to have the variation of presence and absence to look for the correlations. If you've got something that doesn't vary, then, then, then you don't have the materials to do this kind of analysis. The, the, the alternative way, I was thinking about the probabilities, yeah. you don't have to have actual correlations in the actual world. You might need them to figure out what the probabilities are in some cases. Um, maybe you can figure them out with that theory. But, um, you don't, you don't need that kind of structure to actually determine what the probability, to determine the probabilities they come from. And so, I mean, right at the beginning I said, look, we're thinking of something that's law-like, it's behind the 
the finite sample frequencies and maybe you're going to find cases where you've got laws that imply variation this without this without this when in actuality you don't actually have any variation but but at least you've got to have enough structure to infer that behind the the actuality are, are laws which involve the possibility of independent variation any it's different my thought though yeah so um to kind of go by big picture questions mm -hmm. intervention is a mm -hmm. as the reduction for causality mm -hmm. um seems very intuitive when you have this mathematical model of dag and mm -hmm. equations mm -hmm. and it's very give you precision to say quantificationally how much cause influence there is mm -hmm. and so on so it's wondering why why um people don't want to think of this as a um proposal for reducing causation like Woodward and Pearl. I mean are they just uh, thinking of uh, operationally do science and don't need more about that I wish I wish That's I knew on. I wish I knew more of the answer. So among the philosophers of science So who does it? I mean, Gleemor et al. Nancy Cartwright is a uh, uh, very influential figure in this area. Uh, uh, Jim, I mean, I think Clark and Jim, they're not really very interested in metaphysics. They're interested, they're interested in the, the, the formalisms, the technicalities. Nancy is very committedly anti-metaphysical. I mean, she's very committed to the idea that there isn't anything nice and clean and uh, uh, analyzable in nature, it's all a mess. Uh, so the philosophers of science kind of, they don't want to do this kind of uh, reduce everything to something nice and simple, metaphysics. Judea Pearl, I think, is a different, different thing. So there's a tradition among the, the statisticians and computer science to do this stuff that they don't like the notion of causation because it's kind of metaphysics. I mean, go, go back to you know the the, the logical empiricists. I mean, we get rid of it. We're just going to work with. Right. And so when they first figured out that they had this machinery that allowed them to represent all kinds of complicated uh, conditional unconditional correlations very simply in terms of graphs with arrows, I mean that's how they first developed it. They said, no, don't think of these arrows as, as anything to do with causation. All we have here is a structure of all kinds of complicated correlations and this is just a very nice simple way of, of representing it. And I think Pearl had a bit of an uh, epiphany. He, he kind of started off in that tradition mm -hmm. and then he thought, no, no, this is much more exciting than that. We're really getting onto something real. It's to do with causation. It's to do with what people ought to act on. It's to do with what, what grounds counterfactuals and so on. And so he's kind of committed to the idea, look, it's not just a structure of correlations. It's something more than that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, to articulate what I think is going through his mind. I mean, it, it, that's not an argument against reduction. Yeah. But you can see why he might be keen to say there's something more here than just patterns in the correlations, because that's what the bad old people who weren't interested in correlation used to say. But in fact, I mean, I guess he doesn't realize that, 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 that uh, reduction is not elimination, that you can kind of simultaneously say it's, yeah, it's really exciting, it is causation, and it is it is just the, the, the structure and the correlations. In his book, he has this between his own framework and yeah. Lewis, from a factual account. Yeah. Um, but in the end, he's refrained from saying this is a reduction of causation. But it's not based on any philosophical objection to the demon. Um, so one thing we haven't talked about is counterfactuals. And I don't know about, about Pearl. There are many philosophy of science in the Lewis tradition now that appeal to these kind of causal models to deal with lots of issues that were very difficult for Lewis and the causal models give you a bit more uh, machinery to deal with cases of, of, of preemption and trumping and so on. 
A lot of them still think that the, the models represent counterfactual, complicated counterfactual facts. So at the bottom are the counterfactual facts. And, uh, but they're not specially interested in what I've been so excited about always is that you can infer the models from correlations. The philosophers aren't really interested in the fact that you can start with correlations and get the, the causal model. I mean, Pearl, of course, is interested in that, so, yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah, this is what's going the most interesting question. Yeah. When do you have causation? When do you have new correlation? I, th I think Pearl's resistance to, to, to reducing causation to, to correlational structures is, is just his desire to distance himself from that kind of positivist positive attitude, which really was eliminating causation. Okay, so uh, sure. maybe continue it there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.